We're in 1 Timothy and chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. I'm going to go ahead and read the first 16 verses. We're going to be spending a couple of weeks in this portion. Last uh, Lord's Day, we dealt with the first two verses, but I want to read from verse 1 to verse 16 for sake of the context. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters, with all purity. Honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, let me just pause to mention this, that the word nephews is the translation of a word that is speaking of uh, ancestors. And the English word nephews at one time actually meant what grandchildren mean now. And so the, the use of this word nephews in the day in which it was used, and this is the 1769 edition of, of the King James, but in that day, nephews actually referred to grandchildren. So if you have a translation or somewhere in your translation it says grandchildren, that is absolutely correct. That's kind of the idea here. Nephews are more in line with the word grandchildren. But if any widow have children or grandchildren, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed, and desolate, trusteth in God, and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel, generally translated unbeliever. Why the translators chose the word infidel here rather than unbelievers, I don't know. Oftentimes when we hear the word infidel today, we're thinking Muslims, Islam, because that's the word they use for anybody that's not a Muslim, they're infidels. Well, the word simply means unbelievers. Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation or condemnation, because they have cast off their first faith. And withal they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. We're looking at the care that God has ordained for us for widows. And in this passage, it is primarily geared to address the church. But in the addressing of the church, we as individual families and believers are addressed as well. And so the responsibility of the care for widows, not only by the church as a church, but as individual families as families, is instructed in this passage, as well as the exceptions to that. And we'll be working our way through those thoughts over a couple of messages. As you may remember from last week's message, family language is common in the New Testament to describe relationships within the church. By the new birth, 
of the Spirit of Christ. We are children of God. By adoption, we are the sons of God. We heard that really in the last hour. And we're that in Jesus Christ. And in Him we are brethren. So we have this family language throughout the Scriptures. And so in verses 1 and 2, Paul emphasizes a proper relationship in the church, within the church, that he categorizes as family. And we are to relate to one another depending on the category, male, female, and age difference as father, mother, brothers, sisters. And that is a relationship that we are to keep in mind as we engage with one another in the church. We're to treat one another really as we would family members, but really in Christ even a greater relationship binds us together. In verse 3, Paul addresses both family and church family responsibility toward widows who in Paul's day represented a relatively large base within the churches. There's been a great deal of discussion by those who think about these things as to why this was. You go back to Acts chapter 6, for example, in verse 1, I'm saying there seemed to be a large population of widows in the church in the early New Testament church. And I'm not going to get into all the reasons why that may have been, because that really isn't the point of the message. I don't think that's even the point of the passage. The, ma the fact of the matter is, where there are widows, we have a responsibility. to So whether it be that in our congregation or in our culture, there be an increase of widows or not, we have a responsibility. But there were, it seemed, many in the early New Testament church. Acts 6 and verse 1, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. That is, uh, the, those that were more of a Greek, Greekish Jew, a Hellenistic Jew as they call them, and those who were Hebrews of the Hebrews, like, like Paul said that he was. And there was this disagreement that was going on between them because their widows, that is the Grecians, were neglected in the daily ministration. It seemed that there was a, a, a a common pool from which the widows were being cared for. It was something that was customary. It had already been established, probably even within the Jewish community, and it probably carried over into the community of the Jews, which made up the church. And so they carried out this responsibility of care for the widows. But there were those that were being neglected. But there were enough of them that this stirred up a problem. In fact, it was on the basis of that that it seems that deacons were first selected there. At least we think those were deacons. We know that they are called deacons later on, though they're not actually called deacons there in Acts chapter 6. But it seems they fit uh, that which is the responsibility of deacons, caring for the needs of those within the assembly. Acts chapter 9, we see another reference. Acts chapter 9 and verse 39 then Peter arose. This is not in Jerusalem. This is in Joppa. Peter arose and went with them. And when he was come, this is, remember, the raising of Dorcas from the dead. And Dorcas had a, had a ministry. She had a ministry to widows. The widows were excited. I mean, they, were, they grieved greatly when Dorcas died because she was such a huge help in their lives. And then when she was raised from the dead, they rejoiced along with the rest of the church. But Peter, it says, when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber and all the widows, verse 39, stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed and turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise, and she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up and gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And so there, were, there was this, it seemed that there were widows in the assemblies, maybe a larger number than what we're even accustomed to, or at least widows who were in greater need in that day than our own. But regardless of the reasons... The fact uh, that there were these many widows, the fact is clear that there were many and, and, and that they were not to be overlooked by believing families or churches. Now, the instruction that Paul is giving here when he comes to verse 3, he's still, he's writing to Timothy. 
And he's been focusing upon Timothy and the leaders within the church or the churches surrounding Ephesus. And in verse 3, he is still speaking to Timothy. And he says, Timothy, honor widows that are widows indeed. But he's not just speaking to Timothy. We know this because Timothy was to take that which was being given to him and transfer it to the church. For example, verse 7. And these things give in charge that they, and I think here he's talking about the church generally, they may be blameless. He may be collecting together all that he's referring to here in the word they. But I think he has in mind especially the church, that the church might be blameless, that the church might function in such a way that there would be nothing that would be brought against them in a justified way from the culture or anyone else. The church would be above reproach in their care of widows. So that's what's going on in this passage. Now, there are many sub-points that Paul makes in this lengthy passage, and it would be easy for me or any preacher to grab a hold of one of these sub-points and make a whole message about it, and it could be done. There's nothing wrong with that, but I'm not attempting to do that as we work through this section. I'm attempting to stay within the context of Paul's thoughts here to the church. Uh, the primary point is the care of widows and distinguishing those for whom the church bears responsibility. You'll note that the whole section begins and ends with this emphasis. In verse 3, he says, Honor widows that are widows indeed, that are truly widows. And then in verse 16, he ends it the same way that it, the church, may relieve them that are widows indeed. Those are the bookends to this section. So that's the subject matter. That's what he's honing in on. Widows, those who are truly widows. And I say in the process, he talks about other things, and we're going to talk about other things, but that is the primary focus of these thoughts in these verses. It is no small matter to God that the care of widows should be a chief concern for his people. That is not a sub-point. That is a primary point. In fact, as I hope to show you, it is an evidence actually of the gospel at work in us. You know, the gospel is not just theory. The gospel is not these deep theological truths about the atoning work of Christ is grand and glorious and hell. Oh, please do not think that I'm for a moment minimizing that, but I'm saying to you, there is power in that gospel that works its way out in our lives that affects us. And one way in which it affects us is in our relationships. And a way in which it affects us as we see here is in our attitudes toward those who are the most needy among us, and here in particular, widows. God's design in creation is for a man to be the provider and protector of his wife. I don't care what the culture tells you. That is God's design. While there are exceptions to this rule for various reasons, and I'm not going to try to catalog all of those, the responsibility of provision in a family falls primarily upon a man. You'll note that in this section or anywhere that I'm aware of, are there specific instructions like we find in our passage that pertains to widowers or men who are left without their wife. Their wife. Men, generally speaking, are intended to fend for themselves. The concern of this instruction is gender specific, much like back in chapter 2. And I know our culture today doesn't like that. But God is very gender specific. I read it just this morning in Genesis. It was interesting. Uh, this was speaking of the animal world and and God was telling Noah what to load up on the ark and it was it was load up a male and his the King James and his female. I know that sounds kind of strange to say it that way, 
But over and over again, it was repeated. What is that telling you? God has an order. And, and, and though mankind tries to transcend that order, change that order, or trans whatever that order, God is not pleased with that. God has an order, and it is a gender-specific order. And that is much of what we see here in this particular passage. A gender-specific order. Widows, especially in ancient times, often found themselves incapable of providing their own needs. And in many cultures, they had to resort to prostitution or other ungodly means to survive. And I'm not going to take the time to try to color that up for you. You can, uh, I don't even want your imaginations going there, really. But there were cultures that were horrific in the way, in what women were called upon to do to have to make ends meet. It still happens in our own day in some cultures. But ancient Israel and the New Testament church were to be a model for the world in a different way. So that God says to His people, dating back to the nation of Israel, Exodus 22 and verse 22, You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. You see, they were moving into the land of Canaan. They were leaving Egypt, moving into the land of Canaan, where apparently many horrific things were being done. And so there were laws put on the books under Moses that touched upon things that you and I might say, really, who would do that? But they were doing it. The reality is in our world today, there are things being done that would probably cause your stomach a bit of sickness if you heard the details of what are being done in our very own day. Maybe even in San Antonio, in the darkness of night or behind closed doors. But God says in Deuteronomy 27, 19, Cursed be he that perverteth the judgment of the stranger, fatherless and widow. And all the people shall say, that's what they were supposed to say, Amen. Isaiah 1.17, God says, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. In James 1.27, we probably know best, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. God cares about widows. It is significant that on the cross, Jesus in agony. You know where I'm going? In agony, there upon that cross, he looks and he sees his mother and he sees the one that he loved, the beloved disciple John. And he said to John, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, John editorializes, that disciple took her into his own home. Jesus Christ cared how his mother, his widowed mother, was going to be taken care of after he departed this world. And so I am saying, this is a significant matter to our God, who is our Father. The gospel of Jesus Christ is what moves us and changes us and impacts us to not only have a natural filial love and relationship that much of the world has toward our families and our parents, but, but moves us to think even more carefully and more specifically, and not only about our own, but about others who have needs that we as a church might be able to relieve. Honor widows that are widows indeed. Those who are truly widows. Now what does Paul mean by honor widows? 
Does he simply mean respect widows? Well, certainly that's what the word means, and it could be, and it does really mean respect widows. It does mean, in a broader sense, show respect to widows. This word is used in a number of ways in the Scriptures. In 1 Peter 2, verse 17, honor all men, love the brotherhood, honor the king. And so we know that that is speaking of a relationship of respect that is to be given to certain individuals. And in fact, in some sense, all of those who make up mankind honor all men. There's a certain respect that is to be given to our neighbors, to one another. But there's something more here than that. Remember, God also says, honor thy father and thy mother. It's the same word, honor, that is used here. There is an honor that is due to all widows who are mothers, especially. But I think we could say to all widows. But not all widows are mothers. Not all widows are destitute. Not all widows are incapable of provision. I thought about Lydia. Remember Lydia, the seller of purple and her household? Nothing, as I recall, was said about Lydia's husband. It's as if Lydia was caring for herself and her family. It seems that Lydia had a business. It seems that Lydia was providing for herself. Lydia would not have fallen under the category of being, as we will see, a, a widow indeed. But she was a, a widow. Not all widows are to be supported by the church, in other, in other words. The church is not a welfare station for all the needy widows in the world. And this is delineated for us in this passage. But here when Paul writes, honor widows that are widows indeed, honor widows, this involves a level of care that is beyond mere respect, honor in that sense. It carries with it the idea of monetary respect. That is, taking care of them, providing for them. Jesus uses this idea and when He... He uses the idea of honor thy father and thy mother and attaches this idea of money to that in the Gospels when he was confronted by the Pharisees in Mark chapter 7, and I think it's also in Matthew maybe 15. But in Mark chapter 7, you remember that time when uh, Jesus was, or the, uh, the Pharisees were chiding Jesus because his apostles did not come from the marketplace and partake of food uh, after washing their hands. Remember that? They, they're, they're eating without washing their hands. They're not talking about washing the dirt off. I'm talking about washing the uncleanness, the impurities, uh, the defilement of being out there with, uh, you know, maybe Gentiles and others or whatever they may have touched. And they base that upon their own commandments, not the law of God. And so Jesus challenges them with the way that they lifted their own traditions above the commandment of God, and in fact, actually made the command of God of none effect by their own traditions. And here's what he pointed out. He says, God says, Moses wrote, honor thy father and thy mother. But you say, you give an out, and your out is this. If a son or a daughter were to say, korban, that is, the money that should have been used to help out an aging parent has been dedicated in some other way to God, some religious dedication. And you use the word korban, then that money didn't have to be used for your parents. And so you get out, you escape the very command of God by your own traditions. Korban was not a God-given tradition. And so you escape the very command of God. I bring this up just to point this out, that Jesus sees honor thy father and thy mother to be in connection with the use of money in caring for a needy father or mother, and in our case, a widow. We have a responsibility. And there is no command of God that enables us to escape that responsibility. There are those widows who are widows indeed, they're truly widows, for whom the church is responsible. Who are these widows indeed? I believe it's safe to say, and excuse me for having to do this, but I've got a, the allergies are messing with me. 
Most widows should have family support. Can we begin there? I believe that's true. Most widows, if our families are structured the way they ought to be structured in a God-ordained way, in a God-glorifying way, most widows should have family support. But there are reasons, and the reasons are many, and the reason, reasons actually may be increasing in our generation that widows will not have the kind of support that they generally should have because families are not being structured the way they ought to be structured. And that's a message all of its own. But widows indeed are those that have no family to care for them. Now let's address this idea in verse 4 and verse 16. He, Paul seems breaks into the idea, honor widows that are widows indeed. He returns to it in verse 5 to begin to talk about who those are. But here he says in verse 4, But if any widow have children or nephews or grandchildren, let them learn, let these children and grandchildren learn first to show piety at home. Godliness at home, to requite their parents, to repay, to pay back, their, to give back to their parents, to have that honor and that respect, understanding what their parents and grandparents mean, meant to them. And they are where they are today because of what they did for them. And so requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. And then in verse 16, if any man or woman that believes have widows, let them relieve them. Let them relieve them. It's their responsibility. Don't let the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Well, widows indeed have no family to care for them. Children and grandchildren need to learn to show piety at home. And we need to teach our children and grandchildren to show piety, godliness at home by way of caring for their parents as their parents cared for them. This is huge. Your responsibility with your children, our responsibility with our grandchildren, is not simply to memorize the Scripture and, ch and cart them off to church each week and be engaged in ministry outside the home. Our responsibility is to teach them to first show piety or godliness at home. In the way we relate to one another, within the structure of the family. We have that responsibility. This family dynamic and care that Paul is talking about here is good and acceptable before God. It's pleasing to God. It is not less than something else. Please don't miss, as we are really, I guess you would say, taking a drive-by, verse 4. We're not camping here. But don't miss the significance of godliness being demonstrated in the home. No amount of ministry can make up for neglect of basic needs of parents and grandparents. Somebody who is engaged in some sort of, at least what they call, ministry, and they're all about giving themselves to the, what they call the work of God, but they have a mother, and especially a widowed mother, who is in need and they're neglecting her. There is no godliness in that person's life. Paul says, let them first, there's a priority here. Let them first learn to show, not to talk about it, but to show it. Piety at home. Let them work it out. Let them demonstrate this God-honoring relationship. True godliness. We must not allow, especially in this American culture, we must not allow our welfare state mentality, and maybe it's this way in other developed nations of the world. Sometimes we get developed beyond our own good. We certainly get developed beyond godliness. We must not allow a welfare state mentality to lead us to neglect our God-given responsibility toward God. 
our parents and grandparents, especially widows. Well, I'm glad they have Social Security. I'm glad they have Medicare and Meta Share and Meta Meta whatever, Meta Vac, Meta everything else. You know, I'm glad somebody's taking care of my mom and dad. Well, here we're talking about mom. Widows. You know, I'm glad I don't have to be burdened with that. Is that a godly attitude? We're living in a generation where it almost seems like the older people get, the more they get in the way. Oh, and that, that, it does cramp our style, doesn't it? Just like you and I cramped our mom's style when we were having to have our diapers changed every couple of hours and fed every two or three hours. That's the point. Let them first show piety at home and to requite their parents. Repay them. This is godly. And it is godly to structure our lives and our finances in a way that includes care for needy mothers and grandmothers especially. Do you think about this? Are you thinking about that time when your mom may... I know there's a world of potential here, but when your mom is really in need, will you be able to take her into your home? Do you have a room set, a, set aside for that? Are, are you structuring? Are you so engaged with this culture and this world and the mindset of what this world says you must have and what, what you must get and what you must do that you can't be bothered and so you're thinking, you're thankful for the nursing facilities so that you don't have to deal with that. Now, I know there's some yeah buts going to be thrown at, back at me, and I, we, you can deal with that. But I'm not going to deal with the yeah, yeah buts. I'm going to deal with God's Word. I'm talking about an attitude of this is godliness, showing piety at home, thinking about this. How will we care for our aging mothers who may be all alone? Some of you have widowed mothers. And some of you are an example of how to care. And your families, it's not necessarily you. Your family has been structured in such a way where that is taken care of. And it may not be you that's on the front line of caring but participating with the family in the care of a widowed, a widow. The church steps in only when there's no family or support. We're talking about what is a widow indeed. It's one that has no family. Look at verse 5. Now she that is a widow indeed, desolate. There's our word, desolate. It's a description of a widow indeed. She's alone. And in that, it's not just that she is a widow. It's not just that her husband has died, but she's, her husband has died and she has no help. She is alone. She is abandoned. There's no means to provide. She has no resource left to her by her deceased husband or family. The church must take responsibility for this kind of woman. Notice how she is described. This is a widow indeed. Because there are a lot of widows whose husbands, a lot of women whose husbands die, who may be left desolate. And Paul is talking about those for whom the church is responsible. It's not that we can't help others. It's not that we can't help those who are unbelievers. We can but the command, the responsibility, the expectation is that our first line is the household of faith. We should do good to all men, but especially those who are of the household of faith. And so this woman, the widow indeed, is of the household of faith. Verse 5, what does she do? What's the description? She trusts in God. It's a characterization of her life. This is not a command. Paul isn't saying, 
saying, now the widow indeed, you need to trust in God. No, he's saying a widow indeed is one that does trust in God. That's a description of her life. This is a characterization. This is the life of a godly woman. Her heart is fixed upon God with expectant hope. She has no human help. Uh, she, she knows God's thoughts toward widows, though. This is a godly woman. She trusts in God. She knows, I don't have a family. I don't have anybody that I can look to and ask for help that's going to provide for me. I'm looking to God because I know what God said. God says this, the Lord preserves the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and the widow. And the widow knows that scripture in Psalm 146 and verse 9. And other scripture that speaks of his care for widows. And so she says, I'm trusting him. What is the evidence that she's trusting in him? What does it say? And continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. This is a woman that's supplicating. And my guess is not only for herself, but for others. This is a woman who knows something about prayer. This is a woman who knows God. This is a woman who communes with God. This is a woman who spends time before God. She knows her Father in heaven is going to take care of her. It is very possible that as Paul was penning these words, he thought about Anna. Remember Anna or Anna, if you're from this area, uh, in Luke chapter 2 and verse 36. There was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Aser. She was of a great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four, 84 years which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And the point isn't that she didn't do anything else. The point isn't that she just was glued in the temple. It's just that's where her commitment and dedication was. That's where she served. And it was known. She followed through with that commitment that she made to serve the Lord in her state of widowhood. A widow indeed in the church, or in that case, the temple or uh, the system most likely took care of her. And really this is a, a New Testament and a church application of that principle. This is a woman who trusts in God that leads her to a life characterized by prayer. The contrast to this is in verse 6. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she lives. That's the opposite. This is the widow. This is the one whose husband has died. Maybe he's left her with something. Maybe he hasn't. But the point is, she has seen this as a, a moment of freedom. In other words, that man bound me. That man restricted me. That man, that man held me back. And now I'm free. And it was manifested in her wantonness, her, her life of pleasure. And he's going to talk about this more in verse 11. We'll not get to that today. But her life is given squandering money, perhaps seeking to buy happiness. But whatever she was doing, it was clear that her life was one that was primarily uh, characterized by a life of, of pleasure-seeking, not godliness. And Paul characterizes her as dead while she lives. That's an expression of an unregenerate person. There are many such in the world today, not just widows, but others, who look like they're living life, going on all kinds of exciting trips and doing all kinds of exciting things and piling up all kinds of exciting stuff and living in exciting homes and having exciting all kinds of stuff. But they're living and they're living for that and for that pleasure. And the reality is, Paul says, that kind of person, and he says it in another place as well, is dead while they live. No relationship to God. And if you have no relationship to God, you are dead even while you live. Spiritually dead. Paul says that's not the kind of person the church needs to be taking the responsibility for. But it's for that widow whose life is not, not simply a widow who has nothing, 
But a widow who is content with what God has given to her and her heart is bound to Him in Christ and it's manifested by the life that she is living. In contradiction to the other, who whether she has it or not, she is taking advantage of her liberty from that man and living life to the fullest, whatever that would be. In her own case, dead while she lives. Widows indeed, they are firmly devoted to God. Widows indeed are not young. I believe he's speaking of childbearing age in verse 9. Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old. Taken into the number, there's a lot of ink that's been spilt trying to figure out what that exactly is talking about. I am just satisfied with staying within the context and say it's within the number of those that the church takes care of. Some say it was some special group. It might have been deaconesses. It might have been a lot of speculation as to who they may have been. I'm not going to speculate. I'm just going to read it for what it says. Stay within the context and say this is describing those that the church is to take within its number, if they are ones that have need. They're qualified, further qualified here. They're not young. Look at verse 11. But that let the younger, excuse me, but the younger widows refuse. Verse 14. I will therefore that the younger women marry. And he's talking about widows here. Let them marry. And it seems to me then, if I put all these things together, he's referring to those who are ones who have no children. There is no responsibility that they have. And we'll see this especially as we seek to flesh out verses 11 through 16 more next week. Widows indeed, they're not young, of childbearing age. Widows indeed were committed to one man in marriage. Verse 9, and she has a life that has characterized this, the life of a woman who has been devoted to one man. She's been committed to one man. Does this mean that she's only been married once? The King James says, having been the wife of one man. Literally, it is a one man woman, just like for the bishop back in chapter 3, a one woman man. It could be that he is saying only married once. But I don't believe that's sufficient. I believe what he is saying is it is a woman whose life has been characterized by devotion to the man to whom she is married. It's not that she's married and having flings with everybody that's coming and going. She's devoted. She's committed. She's demonstrated this in her life. She is a one-man woman. It's characterized her life. You see, that kind of woman is going to be able to be supported and be trusted to devote herself to spiritual exercises, to prayer, to even ministry within the church, ministry with younger women and so forth. But one who is not characterized by, by, uh, characterized by that is one who is described as perhaps tempted beyond her ability to resist that temptation. And so he speaks to those and says, Mary... But here, it's one who has been the wife of one man. That's a widow indeed. A widow indeed. Furthermore, in verses 9 and 10, are those, as a person, who, a woman who has a reputable life of good works. He says, well reported of for good works. That's the heading. And then the rest of verse 10 is really a fleshing out of some, some examples of that, concluding with a general statement well reported of for good works, if, so here's some examples, if she have brought up children, if she have brought up children, they're grown, she's brought them up, she has demonstrated herself to be a devoted mother, she gave herself to raising her children, and of course this is assuming that she has children, which is the general rule, the exception is that a woman that is married doesn't have children, that's the exception. And there are reasons why a woman may be married and not have children. We're not going to get off into that. But here Paul is saying this woman that is to be taken into the number, that is to be supported by the church, is one who has brought up children. She, you know when a woman brings up children, she has given herself to that task 
And she's not given herself to other things. In other words, she's not a career-minded woman. She hasn't done other things. You know, a woman who is, who is married, and we could debate over this, and I'm not going to debate from the pulpit here, but, you know, a woman who is married but has no children must do something with her time. And as a young woman, if she's not doing something with her time that's profitable, that's beneficial, she's going to run the risk of the same sins that are mentioned in verses 13 and, uh, and 14 and so forth that are spoken of the woman that is not married, that is a young widow. Does that make clear? Does that, does that make sense what I'm saying? And so Paul is saying the widows that the church needs to take on, the responsibility of caring for are those who have been faithful in the raising of children. And by the way, you might be thinking, as I did, well, if she's brought up children and she did a good job, shouldn't they be taking care of her? Well, um, yeah. But you know what? Did you know that children that are brought up sometimes die before mom does? And so the point is, she was faithful in what she did. The condition of, their, of, her, of her children... And by the way, the children that she was brought up, it doesn't say that they were converted. It doesn't say they were believers either. And there are children that are brought up under the nurture and admonition of, of the Lord and depart from that and don't give mom a time of day. So all of that is covered here. But she was faithful. She lodged strangers. You notice that? She had lodged strangers. She demonstrated hospitality. This is a widow indeed. She maintained a home ready for traveling guests. That's the point. Lodged strangers. She's not, not family members, not people she knew. It's people she didn't know. But in that day, especially among the believers, when you went from, home, uh, from city to city, you looked for another believer to house you. And that's the idea. The lodging of strangers might take us in this, particularly in the context. The next one is she has washed the saints' feet. Probably, primarily, a relationship to other believers. She has lodged strangers. Her home was a welcoming place. And she was known for this. That was able to be identified. Hey, sisters, are, are you listening to me? These are things that you need to give yourself, att give attention to in your own life right now so that someday when you are a widow, this will be things, these, these descriptions will be descriptions that characterize your life. These are good things that really ought to apply to every believing, married woman especially. If she have washed the saints' feet, the common work of a servant in that day. So what is Paul saying when he says she has washed the saints' feet? I believe he's speaking of a humble servant spirit. She has humbly served. Not just literally washed the saints' feet, though that very possibly was true. It was a common activity in that day. It didn't matter if it was muddy or dry streets. When they came into a home, they had a basin with water and the and the, the, the feet were washed. The servants usually did that. But believers act like servants, don't we? We have the servant mindset, spirit of humility. And the woman being described here has that characteristic about her. She relieved the afflicted. If she have relieved the afflicted, Likely, Paul is in, the, the, when Paul uses this word afflicted, I think in every case, you can check it out, but in every case that he uses this word afflicted, he is talking about some sort of persecution, some sort of suffering related to being a follower of Jesus Christ. And it seems like that's the idea. She has relieved the afflicted. She has been one who showed concern for those who were suffering for the cause of Christ. And she did what she could do in the context of her own home, or in ministering to those that are afflicted. And she was known for that. She had a heart for others, a heart that went beyond herself and even her own family. Diligently, it says, if she have diligently followed every good work, she gave herself to this, pursued this, the list could be enlarged here. This is sort of a catch-all expression at the end of a, a list. Here's a few things, a few standout things, but other things could be said. This is a woman who was committed. A woman who was known to be generous, humble, 
a servant, and having a caring spirit. Brethren, these are the women who are widows indeed. And it is for these that the church must take into the number. Oh, how we have, at least in my own mind, have had to give consideration to this. I don't know if you have or not, but we have one who came close to being a widow this past week. And, and I, as I thought about this, interesting, Jeremy, Jeremy, uh, Jer, yeah, that fell out there. Jeremy and I, as we talked about it, that was brought up. What a prime example as we're coming into this passage, how fitting it is that we have been dealing with the thought of how will we care for Rhonda Galavis? Should we care for Rhonda Galavis? Does she fit what we're seeing here in this passage? And honestly, as much as I can tell, her picture would be on the page if we were going to give an example of somebody who fit everything that we've described everything that Paul has mentioned in this passage. And we as a church must find ourselves in the position and with a mindset of commitment to help and make provision. I had a pastor call me this past week and he said, Brother, this was after the surgery, I believe. And he said to me, I want you to know, they are a supporting church. He said, I want you to know that when God takes Brother Andreas... Because it's, it's it, you know, the, the, the ticker's only going to tick for so much longer. He's under, he's 100% being kept going by the ICD. So, you know, that's, there's a limited time frame. Batteries don't go forever, you know. Neither do our own hearts that aren't attached to batteries, by the way. But the point is, he said to me, I want you to know that we're committed to continuing to support as a widow. And I appreciated that. And I think that's something that we as a church need to take upon our minds. Now, it isn't caring at whatever level of comfort and wants a widow may have, but the reality is that kind of widow would fit verse 6, living in pleasure. And that kind of wo woman would demonstrate that she needs something more than monetary support. She needs to be born again. But widows indeed, caring for widows, whether in your own family or those in the church without family, it is not optional. And let me just bring this to a close with this thought right here. We'll pick up with this thought next week, that caring for our widows is a gospel-related issue. It is not outside the gospel. It is not simply a law thing, a legal thing. It is a gospel thing. If Christ dwells within us, if we are born from above, we are evidencing the very faith that we proclaim by our care for widows. And when we don't do so, we are manifesting that we are not of the faith. We are infidels, unbelievers. Did you see that in verse 8? But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Listen, it is generally accepted. Even in, in the, the world at large, at least it has been. I don't know where the world is now, but at one time there was this family dynamic and connection where people felt the burden of caring for those within their family, unregenerate and regenerate alike. It was customary. And I think that's where Paul is going with this when he says they are worse than an infidel, worse than an even unbelievers know that they should care. For widows. And so when you, as a professing believer, somehow, whether it's through some religious, uh, some extravagant thinking and reasoning of religion or whatever it may be, some theological hanky panky that you play to excuse yourself from that responsibility, you are demonstrating yourself to be worse than those who out and out deny the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wouldn't want to stand in the day of judgment if I were you and give an account of myself. Some have said, well, this doesn't mean that they weren't really 
the children of God. Well, if it doesn't mean that, I still say, and I do believe it does mean that, but if it doesn't mean that, I, I say, I wouldn't want to stand in their shoes in the day of judgment. You'll notice in verse 16, he says, if any man or woman believes, I'm saying this is a gospel issue. It is an evidence that you believe individually in caring for those in your own family, but as a church, as we collectively care for those that God has given to us the responsibility to take care of. Listen, this is good and acceptable to God. People say, well, what is it that pleases God? There you go. There's one thing. Uh, there's a lot of things, but here's one thing. You don't, we don't have to debate this. We, we don't have, well, I wonder what the will of God is. And what, you know, I just feel burdened to go to Africa as a missionary, but my, but my mother, you know, if I go, she's going to be left all alone. Oh, I'll just let the church take care of her. Oh. Do you see where something's messed up in that thinking? You say, preacher, be careful. I, I, I am being careful. First, show piety at home. Show godliness at home. Is there a way in which there may be a biblical, uh, biblical way in which to take care of widow, mom, and also serve in some ministry capacity? Absolutely, there may be. But I'm saying, don't shirk that responsibility for the sake of something that you think is higher or more noble. As I see the Word of God here, there's really nothing that fits that bill. So church, let us be careful to honor widows. All widows, but in relationship to our care of them, widows that are widows indeed. Father, I thank You for the opportunity of proclaiming these words today. I